Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thanks to the Buffalo Bill Center of the West for holding this symposium. Thank you uh, to C-SPAN for filming it. This is a wonderful opportunity to get the story of Buffalo Bill and the West out to uh, the broad American audience. That is the goal of all of us in this business, to try and inspire others with the story of the American West and show why we love it so much. Today, we, this morning, we have three folks who are going to inspire you and uh, make you fall even more in love with the uh, American West, and we're going to uh, have them speak in alphabetical order. I learned to do that back in Mrs. Sloggenbach's class in the fifth grade, and so that's, that's the way we're going to do this. Uh, and uh, I'll introduce them individually as they appear. First, we have uh, Jeff Broom. Uh, who I've known for many years, and Jeff is uh, very active in uh, not only the academic world, but also the world of popular history and writes uh, magazine articles for True West, for Wild West magazine, and, and uh, belongs to many uh, Western organizations. He got his PhD at the University of Colorado in uh, Boulder. Colorado seems to be a uh, theme here, uh, here today um, because of where people are buried, even though they didn't want to be buried there. Uh, that's pretty bad, you know, when you kidnap a dead body. Uh, you know, they kept him on ice for like six months and then uh, planted him up there now where he resides. Uh, you know, he could reside here in the vastness and the beauty of, uh, of the Bighorn Basin and, and towering trees, you know, would, would lie in his grave and instead he now has all of the radio and television towers for the city of uh, Denver uh, surrounding him. Uh, but I'm sorry, I digress. Jeff is, <laughs> Jeff is from Colorado, but we're not going to hold that against him. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful state, just to the north of uh, New Mexico, where I live, which is really wonderful. Um, he's a professor emeritus of, uh, uh, of history in, uh, in uh, Colorado, where he taught for 32 years. Uh, he's very young. I don't know how that's possible. Uh, and he's the author of three books on the Indian Wars, including Dog Soldier Justice um, and uh, The Cheyenne War, Indian Raids on the Road uh, to Denver. He's going to talk today about Buffalo Bill and one of his uh, most famous uh, moments on the historical stage, the Battle of Susanna Springs, known today as Summit Springs, Jeff Broom. Uh, that's my PowerPoint slide. Are there any questions? <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Uh, it is an honor to be here today and to be asked. I'm going to talk about uh, Cody's Indian fighting experience. This could be my focus on the battle at Summit Springs, but I want to say a couple of things before that. First, the PhD. I'm actually a professor of philosophy, um, and um, I was ABD for many years, and and I always ask my, uh, my mentor w w what it means to have a PhD. He says, you get to put your name or your you know, PhD next to your name. So that's why that's there. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say what today is, August 2nd in 1876, a good friend of uh, uh, Buffalo Bill Cody, and that's uh, James Butler Hickok, uh, was killed in Deadwood. Um, five months younger than General George Armstrong Custer, and five weeks later, from Custer's death, he died um, shot in the back of the head. Um, you'll see if you get into the museum that uh, Cody and Buffalo Bill go back to uh, Cody's young, young years. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I want to mention is since the first uh, talks, we're talking about um, the legacy, really, of, of Buffalo Bill in the Wild West. Uh, I'm a fifth-generation Colorado native, so my great-grandfather was born in 1867, and he was a um, ranch foreman, and for about 20, 25 years, he ran a big ranch up there in North Platte and uh, Columbus. Family history says that he uh, did work for Cody uh, sometime during then, but I don't know if that's true. However, what is true is a story uh, that was passed down from my grandmother, and my cousin has this, and I... I mention this because, Steve, I think that we ought to go down to Pueblo and take pictures of what I'm about to say, because maybe from photographs we can identify who this person was. But in talking about the Lakota and uh, going over to England and all that, um, when my family would go up, my father was born uh, one month after Cody died. And so when he was about two or three, they were up there 
um, at, uh, visiting uh, her parents uh, at the ranch, and, uh, and my grandmother had become close friends with a woman from England who had married one of the performers and had come over in Pine Ridge, and this is like 1925 now, 1930, somewhere around there, um, and became very close to her and told her that she got kind of suckered into marrying this guy because when he was over there and he learned about the kings, he said that he was a king over in America, and they called him chiefs. And so uh, anyway, she married him and, and uh, came with him and uh, was living in a, in a teepee um, for most of her life. And she was rather bitter at the time that she met uh, my grandmother. But she gave my grandmother his performance clothes. Uh, the, the, um, the Lakota had passed on, and she was widowed. And so my cousin has them. It's the vest. It's the... It's the uh, uh, gloves and it's the shoes and I think there's some other things too that he had. Uh, and maybe we need to get a picture of those, see if we can uh, identify those. Um, I'm going to cover some things real quick here. Uh, to understand the, the fight at Summit Springs, which was July 11th, 1869, you have to go back to 1868. You really go back earlier, but that's where the violent outbreaks really started in cent north central Kansas. There were a series of raids. Uh, Sarah White was captured on uh, August 12, 1868. Uh, 35 settlers were killed. Those included uh, women and children. Um, and then in another uh, raid two months later, on October 13th, um, uh, the Anna Morgan was captured one month into her uh, marriage, exactly to the day. Uh, both women were uh, held in, in captivity until rescued by Custer in March uh, of 1869 on the Sweetwater in the Texas Panhandle. Um, there is a dedication uh, for um, Anna Morgan um, next Friday, a week, uh, not this Friday, but uh, next, uh, where they have uh, dedicating this memorial marker in Delphus, Kansas. I'll be out there then. Um, she did get impregnated, and she did have a son, and that son died, um, and uh, named it Ira. Um, and then uh, w with that, then uh, General Sheridan started a winter campaign, which involved three columns of troops, uh, one of them led by uh, General Carr. Uh, uh, Carr was uh, where Cody was the chief of scouts, and that had been appointed uh, uh, some months before uh, when Cody was working as a, a dispatch rider uh, with the different forts and all that and really impressed General Sheridan. And he assigned him to um, Brevet Major General uh, Eugene A. Carr. Um, and so uh, they were sent down in that Texas panhandle area along with the Colonel Evans and his troopers and then General Custer was called back from a court martial and sent uh, down with the 7th Cavalry, 11 troopers. The 19th Kansas Volunteer uh, Cavalry was also supposed to be there, but uh, they got lost coming down to the camp in the winter weather, and they missed it. But we had the uh, famous Battle of the Washita on November 27, 1868, where uh, Custer, uh, in his report, reported 103 warriors killed and 53 women and children uh, captured and brought back. Uh, this brought Custer into the limelight and of the West into the Eastern press. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, continuing his campaign and going back out again, again in um, March 22nd, I think it was, uh, uh, 1869, he got the rescue of Sarah White and uh, Anna Morgan. That brought him back to Kansas. The horses were all fagged out. At the time that, uh, as we look at this map, at the time of uh, the Washita fight down at the bottom down here, uh, you see oh, about 100 miles in the northwest up over here is where Custer rescued the captives. And this is about uh, where Carr was stationed uh, during those winter months. They uh, 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 didn't uh, corral the Indians. Custer got that. Um, but you can see a lot from here. Uh, Carr was ordered to uh, Fort McPherson right up here uh, on the uh, Platte River um, just above the Nebraska border. Um, from the Texas Panhandle, and on his way up, he stopped at Fort Lyon, which would just be at the end of this map right here on the Arkansas River. And as he began to go up to Fort McPherson, by coincidence, he had two skirmishes. They was actually pretty good fights. Um, and th that was uh, May, May 13th and May 16th, a fight at Elephant Rock and a, a fight at Spring Creek. Uh, 25 soldiers or warriors were killed, and four soldiers were killed at the first fight. And at least that many uh, Indians were wounded and unknown dead um, in the second fight. It was the second fight at Spring Creek where Cody uh, really made an impression upon, um, upon uh, Carr. Now, uh, first, uh, uh, Carr wrote this. 
Uh, our scout, William Cody, who has been with the de detachment since last September, that's 1868, displayed great skill in following it, that's the Indian's trail, and also deserves great credit for his fighting in both engagements, that's uh, Elephant Rock and Spring Creek. His marksmanship being very conspicuous, I wouldn't call him an ordinary man with car riding this before Ned Buntline met him. Um, he deserves honorable mention for this and other services, and I hope to retain him as long as I am engaged in this duty. <clears throat> oh, by the way, this is a famous picture. Uh, the, two, the two men standing are officers that uh, were at Summit Springs, along with uh, Cody with that rifle, which is here in the museum uh, also, uh, and that's what he had at Summit Springs. <clears throat> um, in the Spring Creek fight, um, Carr also mentioned the fact that Cody had a severe head wound. This wasn't a, a, a slight wound. Um, uh, but it didn't stop him from fighting or doing his duties. He, put a, he had his, lost his hat, and he put a bandana across it, and he bled through it. And seeing him at a distance, it looked like he had a, a, a red uh, hat on or something, and it was a bleeding through it. The, the bullet just grazed his skull and went about five inches above his head and just cut it all out, and, and, but it didn't stop him. Um, and not only that, but uh, he then volunteered. They were running out of supplies after these fights, and uh, he saved them a day by getting supplies to them by going on his own up to Fort Kearney. Uh, and then, and then um, the unit went on up to Fort McPherson. Um, and, and again, that's, that's up here, and you can see where these fights were at uh, Spring Creek on May 16th and Elephant Rock uh, along the Beaver Creek uh, in three days earlier. <coughs> um, but if we go back to this map again, after Tall Bull, uh, and Tall Bull is very interesting. You see, when Custer cornered uh, the Cheyenne dog soldiers down on the Sweetwater, he had a few of the chiefs that he had threatened to hang if the captives weren't released. And the deal was is that the chiefs would be released when they go to their reservation. And um, so that was, that was the deal. One uh, one village did not surrender, and that was Tall Bull. And that was Tall Bull then left after that and was on his way up here when just by coincidence he ran into Carr in those two fights. Now Tall Bull then began his revenge and, and led a series of deadly raids that went on for about 14 days, again in that same area in north central Kansas. Uh, Lincoln, Kansas, Beloit, Kansas, Concordia. Uh, Sarah White was captured just a few miles west of Concordia, maybe nine, ten miles west there. And uh, um, Anna Morgan was captured on the Solomon River down about here. Um, so I came through there. He far first started hitting people up here and down here. Um, he, he hit uh, railroad workers at uh, Russell Springs, which is Russell, Kansas today. Um, he hit a new settlement up in um, uh, where White Rock Creek, it's up by the Nebraska border, not far from the Elephant Rock fight, um, where a, a, new, a Danish community had come in. And coincidentally, one man who was out burying Indians, um, that, uh, excuse me, buffalo hunters that had been killed by the Indians, um, and then the Indians swept down and and uh, almost killed his children, and one of the boys that was born after that ended up being the president of the University of Colorado for 25 years, and the Norland Library is named after him. So <clears throat> there was no fight over his body, though, after he died. <laughs> so uh, this, is w this is where the deadly raids went on, and in that, uh, the most famous part of it was the raid on Spillman Creek, which ran into the Saline just west of Lincoln, where um, um, Maria Weichel, who was three months pregnant with her only child and her husband, had just been in from Germany less than about a month when she was captured, her husband killed. Um, and, and then uh, about a mile away uh, with another sortie of Indians, there were about 75 Indians that went down and split up in parties of six and eight and raided the village, uh, raided the settlements and killed 11 settlers. Captured these two women along with uh, eight-month-old little Alice Alderdice and 24-year-old uh, Susanna Alderdice who was five months pregnant with her fifth child. Her s uh, boy who would have been six on, uh, uh, this was May 30th, 1869, the boy who would have been six on July 1st was killed. Um, the boy that was two uh, was killed. Um, the, the girl, uh, the, uh, Alice, was killed in the village. According to Maria Weichel's testimony later, she was roasted alive in one account. Another account, uh, she was strangled and hung in a tree and dismembered. But she was killed in the third day of her captivity because of her incessant crying. Um, so Susanna, uh, who could speak English and no German, and Maria, who could speak no English and only German, were uh, brethren in captivity. 
um, for six weeks to the day. Uh, and this then is why Carr was uh, directed um, by the military to sweep down from Fort McPherson and try to find these Indians doing these raids. We're not even sure who they were, um, and find them. So that started a campaign, whoops, <coughs> which, uh, which, which uh, left Fort McPherson on, um <coughs> on um, uh, June 9th with seven uh, companies of 5th Cavalry and three companies, 50 each, of Pawnee Scouts led by Luther, well, actually Frank North and his brother Luther and their first cousin, Captain, I think it's Sam Cushing, uh, commanded the three uh, uh, companies. Um, when Tom Alderdice, who... Um, was the father of the two of the children, that, uh, that little four and a half year old boy, I'll come back to him later, that was also uh, 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 shot by the Indians there. But um, um, when, when Carr was sent to try to rescue these women, um, he did not know that there were women captives. Tom Alderdice had been away from home on the day of the raid when he came back the next day. He then began a search of the Indians and he followed the creeks, which is what they did, and went about 100 miles and found their village and then came back and went all the way to Fort Leavenworth and wrote a handwritten uh, in pencil uh, where they are and a description of his wife and all that. I found that in the National Archives. And that was, um, that was transmitted by telegraph to Fort McPherson after Carr left. And so they sent a company down with the, um, um, with the description of Susanna and the fact that they are trailing Indians who probably have two female captives. Um, Cody writes falsely in his autobiography that sometime during early on in the expedition they found women's shoe prints, white shoe prints in the villages and knew they were tracking Indians. It was this message from the, uh, uh, the husband of Susanna that is what alerted them to that. Indians, when you study this, never put the white captives in their own garb. They wore Indian garb, they wore moccasins and that was to avoid detection. Um, so. Um, there is a myth there uh, about um, finding uh, women's shoe prints. That's not true. Um, but using this information from uh, Tom Alderdice, then uh, the cavalry, the 5th Cavalry, was sent down from Fort McPherson. Uh, again, uh, we had these uh, seven companies. Uh, I've just already uh, mentioned that. There was a Lieutenant Volkmer just out of West Point. He graduated the year before, and he was assigned as the itinerary officer and to keep a diary. What's real interesting is that when you compare this diary, when Carr writes his reports later, not long after the fight, um, he was at um, Fort Sedgwick um, a few weeks after the fight when he learned that his boy had died and he took a train to Omaha, and he quickly wrote his report out before he left. So he used... Uh, and, and quoted word for word, we call it plagiarism today. Uh, can I see that again? <coughs> Got five minutes. So, uh, uh, but he quoted word for word, and we can understand some of the mistakes that were made with the battle too. Uh, he had 350 cavalrymen, 150 Pawnees. They traveled about 35 miles to get there uh, in uh, eastern Colorado. Uh, this is a modern picture with 84 teepees uh, mixed in it, where the Summit Springs fight is today on private property. Uh, they got there about 2 o'clock. Uh, there's a Schreivogel painting, not historically accurate because it shows a, a soldier getting critically wounded. And there was only one soldier with a glancing arrow wound to his ear that was hurt in this fight. Um, also shows the women uh, dressed as recognizable uh, uh, American citizens, and that wasn't true. But it's a great photograph. They came from the Northeast. Carr said the Northwest, but uh, you can see in quoting from Volkmer, it was Northeast. And they came right down into Summit Springs, right in the Cheyenne Village, uh, and, and attacked it. This, this is a fascinating story. It's, I think, the most important Indian fight on the plains in this era that does not have a book covering it. <coughs> uh, I'm working on one, by the way. At the end of the fight, there, Carr in two reports said in one report 53 warriors were killed, another report um, um, 52, and another report 73. I, I think what it was is that there were uh, uh, Indian uh, civilian casualties. There were women and children that were killed, and I think the total is 73. But George Bent in his letters says that every single woman and child that was killed at Summit Springs was killed by the Pawnee avenging in their hatred on them uh, and not um, by, the, um <coughs> by the soldiers. Twelve horses died in the fight, 11 by exhaustion, chasing most of the village away. 
Um, one was killed in the fight, Sergeant McGrath's horse, and uh, one died uh, uh, by struck by lightning. There was 10 tons of property found in the village after this that re necessitated 160 fires after the inventory on July 12th to, um, um, to, to note it all. There was 160 fires to burn everything, and they still filled six empty wagons that were empty of the provisions with stolen plunder from the Kansas raids, hoping that they could uh, be returned to their proper owners. Um, it was uh, just an amazing fight. It was over in 20 minutes. There were, again, no, um, uh, no soldier casualties except for this slight one. Now the question is, who killed Tobol? <laughs> um, but, uh, Luther North um, says that his brother Frank North killed Tobol, and he said it many times, 10 times, in fact, that they're published accounts. Uh, nine in the Lives and Leg uh, Legends of Buffalo Bill by Russell, and uh, one that got published since then. Um, Luther North did not kill Tobel. When we get to the primary source evidence, well, we, we find that, um, <coughs> that there is an unnamed Pawnee, there's Sergeant Danny McGrath, there's Buffalo Bill Cody, and there's Lieutenant Mason. But when an interesting um, um, memoir that's never been published, um, it's in the Historical Society in Wisconsin, uh, talks about this fight. This guy came in that service and served 35 years, and he gave the enlisted man's account. He, he said that um, uh, what the soldier's view, who killed Talbot, goes to Danny McGrath. Why? Cody was 300 yards from where Talbot was found dead. Now, there was all this smoke and everything, and you couldn't see, but f with his gun, he could kill him. But the, the account says that the smoke and all that, it would have been very, very difficult for Cody to have seen Talbot to get that shot. Uh, same way with uh, uh, Lieutenant Mason. He was 50 yards away, but he shot with a pistol. And, um, and, and again, uh, that wasn't it. But Danny McGrath, after getting his horse shot out from under him, got out with his rifle, and he was 50 yards away. Uh, uh, M Lieutenant Mason was 150 yards away. And with his rifle, took careful aim and killed Tallball. Now, uh, the thing is, is when we look to the eyewitnesses, Carr, in three separate accounts, says Cody killed him, Lieutenant Mason killed him, and uh, Danny McGrath killed him, and an unidentified Pawnee killed him. So we really don't know. The way that I take it down is that we get um, um, uh, probably Danny McGrath, and if not Danny, then Buffalo Bill Cody. But he was there. And, and uh, Luther North tried to uh, take umbrage against that uh, y years later after his brother had died in the Wild West show and, and outliving everybody. And he said that Cody was, uh, uh, was not there and he had missed it. But in fact, he was when you read Carr's points and all that and distinguished himself there. So I think that's it, uh, except that Susanna, there's a, the lady that was captured. Uh, I found her descendants. and. Um, Susanna was buried at the, uh, in an unmarked grave. I just finished up a grant with the state trying to locate her body, and we were not successful. Um, but her little boy with five arrows in his back lived, and I found all his descendants. He was four and a half years old at that capture. Thank you.